Have you heard President John Quincy Adams kept an alligator he received as a gift in a bathtub in the White House's unfinished East Room? He reportedly brought visitors over to view the animal until it was moved to a different home. Hi, I'm Shannon, your friendly C-SPAN podcast producer, and this week the Lectures in History podcast focuses on White House myths. White House Historical Association historian and American University lecturer Matthew Costello talks about myths from the White House tunnel system to decorating traditions and even Dolly Madison's rescue of George Washington's portrait. Stay tuned. Class starts after this. All right, so today's topic, White House myths and popular culture. Uh, You probably have come across these things multiple times, uh, whether you're researching things on the Internet, maybe you even came across them as you were doing research for your papers in this class. But there are a number of stories that just continue to get circulated and circulated and perpetuated. And what I like about this is because you get to not only sort of debunk these things, but you get to try to figure out where they really started and why people grew so attached to them. Because that also tells you a little bit more about how people understand the past and how they use it or misuse it. So, remember earlier in the semester we talked about the Jackson Magnolia. In fact, uh, I think a number of you uh, went into detail about the Jackson Magnolia. And I th- was it Alex? Was it you who wrote about the Jackson Magnolia? Okay, so you you already know all this. But uh, for everybody else, you know, think back to when Jonathan Pliska visited our class, and we talked about the story behind the Jackson Magnolia, and who, who remembers the, the story? Not Alex, because he wrote a whole paper on it, but anybody else? Yeah, William. Uh, Andrew Jackson's wife uh, died right before he went to office, so he planted the tree because it was uh, her favorite tree. Mm-hmm. And he brought the seeds from the hermitage in Tennessee, and, and do you remember what Jonathan told us? Well, he said that there really isn't any type of contemporary evidence. Andrew Jackson never mentions planting a tree. There's nothing in newspapers. So it seems like this is a story that has, of course, these romantic origins, and it's continued to grow from that ever since. So this is actually the first known exterior photograph of the White House. It was taken by a Welsh-born photographer named... Uh, Lou, uh, John Plume Jr. in about January 1846. So if you're looking at the White House, this is 1846. So in theory, Jackson planted his tree already, right? But I don't see a magnolia anywhere. So this also kind of bolsters the case that, you know, perhaps the magnolia came a little bit later than people think. Um, Here's an outdoor shot. Uh, This was by Lewis Walter in 1857-58. There you can see the White House Conservatory uh, on top of what is the West Colonnade going to the area today that is the West Wing. So you don't have all the greenhouses, but you do have the conservatory above the West Colonnade. And again, in that place where you usually have the Jackson Magnolia, I mean, it just looks more like a, a pretty barren tree in the middle of winter. certainly doesn't look like a Jackson Magnolia. However, uh, this is a photograph that was taken uh, by, of the Ca- Cassius Clay Battalion of the Union Army, April 1861, and voila, that looks like the Jackson Magnolia to me. So if we look at that tree, and it's probably at that point, oh, maybe about 15 to 20 feet tall, depends on when it was planted or if it was transported, but the photographic evidence seems to suggest that that famous tree attributed to Andrew Jackson more than likely was planted later, probably sometime in the 1850s. However, that story and that legend has continued to grow and and grow over time. Here's another shot. Uh, This is actually Matthew Brady. So this is during the Civil War. You can see the flagpole on the South Lawn. Uh, And of course, there's part of Jefferson's Ha Ha Wall and some of the Union soldiers who were uh, essentially keeping an eye on the White House grounds. Again, you look and you can see what looks like a young Jackson Magnolia. So again, early 1860s, it looks like uh, there is the famous tree that we all know. Now in 2007, you probably remember this, uh, December uh, December 2017, uh, the Jackson Magnolia made a lot of news because... Uh, there were reports that the tree was going to be cut down because of safety issues. 
and uh, it's announced that it's going to be pruned, and one of its major branches is going to be taken, uh, taken down and preserved. Uh, and you remember from our visit to the White House, you could kind of see, uh, yes, the Jackson Magnolia is still there, but, I mean, it's being held up uh, by a steel pole, by the, these cables, and, and it's because pretty extensive rot uh, on the inside of the tree. And what I did was I pulled up just some of the news stories from December of, uh, of 2017. So uh, what's interesting is, uh, I'll a- I guess I'll ask you, what media outlets do you think published each story? So read this one, and who do you think published this information? Any ideas? Yeah. Nope. Alex. Uh, New York Times. Mm-hmm. Alex. Street.com. No. Oh. CNN. This first one was CNN. All right. What about this one? Matthew. MSNBC. Mm-hmm. Christopher. Daniel. The Washington Post. The Washington Post. Yeah. Now, but do you notice that there's a key difference between the first one and the second one? What word do they use? Lore. White House lore. So if we go back, there's not really... It just kind of repeats the story verbatim that we know. But at least the Washington Post acknowledges that there's, a, there's lore to it. It may not be entirely true. We're just not sure. What about the final one? Any ideas? Yeah, Alex. It's, it's kind of using it as a way to be critical of the president. How so? Because it's talking about how um, they're trying to take down, not because it's old, mm-hmm. but they're trying to kind of talk about how uh, he wants to take it out as a negative way to portray the president. Do you think that, so you think there's a negative portrayal of the president? I mean, it seems like this article is kind of pinning blame on Melania Trump. Yeah, well, that's, right. I think that's the whole Is that what you mean? That's why oh, people okay. would read it. You know what so, I mean? And what, ab- what, about the, uh, what about the language before Jackson Magnolia? So-called. So-called. Uh, this was actually the New York Post. So regardless of, of you know, your politics, or I mean, you can see how these stories have not only continued to the present, but that even when they're then recirculated and put out there, that there are slants to how that story is told. Right. It was very different. But he was considered a Democrat, right. So because of its historical significance and the living history that continues to happen today, public fascination with the White House has created many legends and myths, some of which are still perpetuated by social media, the Internet, journalists, and yes, even historians. The point of today's lecture is not to simply discount or dismiss these fables, but to unpack them and to try to contextualize why they were created in the first place and reinforced time and time again. Now, myth number one, the White House is white because of the British burning. Have you heard that before? You've never heard that. Yeah, Alex. Um, Didn't, uh, if I'm not wrong, it was, they used like whitewash in order to like hold the sandstone together, which is why it's now called, or why it was then called the White House, or named the White House. Exactly. So uh, if you look at the exterior of the White House, that particular sandstone, uh, much of it which came from Virginia, uh, particularly Aquia Creek, uh, in the Aquia Quarries in Stafford County, a lot of the sandstone that was being produced had this gray color. So you have to imagine the White House as a, as a gray building. And uh, what they did, because sandstone is so porous, what you have to do is you have to seal it to protect it from the winter months because if water gets into the stone's pores, it freezes, 
and then it cracks, right? Uh, because water expands in those pores. So what the Scottish stonemasons did and the workers who built the White House, uh, enslaved and free workers who built the White House, they applied a, a coat of lime-based whitewash in 1798. Now, whitewash is obviously a lot different than the white paint that they use today, but that was really sort of where this story began of starting to call it the White House is because it was a whitewash that was first applied. Uh, so they do add the first coat of lead white paint in 1818. This is after the burning. Uh, but that colloquium term of White House had already been established. So the idea that, oh, they started calling it the White House just because of the burning, no, there was a, uh, there was a whitewash that existed before then. Now, they kept applying coats of white paint up until the 1970s uh, uh, during the Carter administration is when they undertook a major project to strip all of the layers of paint off the White House. Now, in some areas of the house, we're talking 30 to 40 layers of paint that had to be removed. And the project ended up taking about 25 years. It was completed during the Clinton administration. So it started at the end of the Carter administration, and here... This gives you some visuals of what the White House looks like without its current variation of white paint. Again, you can see it's primarily gray. It has bits of white in it, but there's also these tints of red. Um, you've probably seen the Smithsonian Castle uh, on the National Mall. Uh, so some of the sandstone quarries, uh, eventually what you, when you dug too deep, you would hit these veins, these, these deep red veins, and sometimes the stone would turn completely blood red. Uh, so that's why we call it Washington Brownstone, a lot of that that was made uh, in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, that is actually sandstone. It's just red sandstone. But from Stafford County, it was primarily gray. Uh, but you can see there's still flecks. There's flecks of, of red uh, within the stone itself. But by stripping all the paint, we could actually see the very intricate detail of the carvings because you have to imagine layer after paint, layer of paint, layer of paint, layer of paint, layer of paint. All of a sudden, all of this is globbed. You can't really see the carvings. You can't see anything. So it took 25 years, but they ended up uh, finishing it during the Clinton administration. And there are still some parts of the White House, and they saw it when they started removing paint, that there are still scorch marks that you can see. Now, on the exterior, it's pretty much all painted. This is actually downstairs... Um, we, we were on the ground floor corridor, but behind it, sort of like the basement area service spaces, this is one of the doorways. And you can see they left it unpainted, and you can see some of the scorch marks still around the frame. But again, you can see the variations of the stone also probably tell you that the stone was coming from different sources. Here's a shot of the north uh, portico. Again, you get a sense of how white the building is, and really you can't see the individual stones, as opposed to uh, here you can actually see each individual stone. And again, flecks of red, streaks of red uh, throughout the North Portico columns. And this is during the Reagan administration. Here's a shot of the north side of the White House. And again, you can see the individual gray stones on either side, uh, but then the still painted portico and the north entrance. So let's just say, hypothetically, you wanted to paint your apartment or a dorm room or something uh, the color of the White House. The closest you can get is uh, Duran's Whisper White that's commercially available. That's, that's as close as you can get. All right, White House myth number two, White House tunnels. Um, in fact, we were just talking about this before class. Uh, the existence of tunnels, who used them, and why did they use them? So one of the stories that there were tunnels beneath the White House that allowed for a quick escape, uh, that one could actually get all the way to the Potomac River, and that Dolly Madison used a tunnel to escape to Octagon House, and Abraham Lincoln had an escape tunnel. Uh, unfortunately, these are not true. We know that James Hoban, the architect of the White House, did build uh, several sewer systems. My guess is Dolly Madison probably wouldn't have climbed through the sewer. Um, she wouldn't have wanted to travel that way. And uh, these were installed for running water, but there really weren't any full-size tunnels that anyone could have used. Now, and here, of course, here's Octagon House. This is where the Madisons lived for about six months after the burning, uh, and it's just, uh, just down the street uh, from the White House. Now, during the Civil War, 
General Winfield Scott did suggest the possibility of adding a tunnel uh, between the White House and the Treasury Building. And here's the Treasury Building down at the bottom, and, uh, and up at the top you have the War Department. Uh, at that point it would have been probably war. You would have uh, Navy and State using that space as well. Uh, but the Treasury Department was to the east of the White House. And the idea was that this could sort of be a, a citadel of sorts. If the Confederate Army invaded Washington and you know, they didn't want President Lincoln to be captured, that they could move him quickly to the Treasury Building, uh, he could seek safety in one of the vaults, and that essentially the people that were guarding him would have to fight to the death. Now, this was an idea that Winfield Scott had. It never really materialized uh, because it didn't, Lincoln didn't have to. Uh, but here's a picture of the Treasury Building later. And again, you kind of get a, a sense of just this imposing spectacle that you know, this would have been a good place that if you were going to move to a fortress-like structure in the 19th century, this was a good place to do it. Now, during Franklin Roosevelt's administration, there actually is an underground tunnel built between the East Wing and the Treasury Building. And in fact, they go so far as to even furnish a room in the Treasury Building for Franklin Roosevelt. Here's a picture of that room. So this is where we start to see the presidency entering that new age of world wars and then the Cold War, and that presidential security obviously changes, but they need to have either structures in place to protect the president in the event of an immediate attack, or in case that there there is a chance that there could be an aerial bombing or later a nuclear weapon uh, targeting the the White House in the United States, that the president has a place to go. Now, during the... Truman administration. That's when two sub-basements are added beneath the ground floor of the White House. So up to the Truman's time in the White House, there really wasn't central air conditioning. There wasn't central heating. Uh, this is a big part of the 1948 to 52 renovation was modernizing the White House. They essentially gut it. They rebuild it, change some things here and there, but it's pretty much uh, made out of concrete and steel. But what they also do is they dig further underground. And part of the reason they do that is because they need that space for things like utilities, air conditioning, electrical, plumbing, but also to add this walkway, uh, which now runs uh, the length between uh, the West Wing and the East Wing. Here's a finished version. And now this tunnel will actually go all the way to the East Wing, and it hooks up with Franklin Roosevelt's bomb shelter. So... Roosevelt had that tunnel built for access to the Treasury Department. But remember, he also has the East Wing built in 1942. And that's the perfect time, if you're building a structure, to be also building something underneath it. So he actually has a bomb shelter made beneath the East Wing. It'll be closer. He doesn't have to get to the Treasury Building. And Truman uh, now connects it between the West Wing and that a secure complex. So if the president is working in the West Wing of the Oval Office, they have a quick way to get to the bomb shelter. And you've probably actually all seen it before. This is actually part of the uh, Presidential Emergency Operations Center that was used on 9-11 uh, by Vice President Dick Cheney uh, and several members of uh, the Bush cabinet. Uh, because remember, for some time, we weren't quite sure where that last plane was heading towards. Uh, it certainly seemed like when it turned in Pennsylvania that it was coming to Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, was it going to the Capitol? Was it going to the White House? We don't know because uh, the passengers on that flight decided to try to take control of the plane and it crashed. But essentially what they did was they rushed uh, White House staff and members of the administration down into the Emergency Operations Center. President Bush was actually away. He was visiting a school in Florida at the time. And they advised him to stay away from Washington, D.C. until they figured out what was going to happen with the last plane. Uh, But for the members of the administration, I mean, there there wasn't really any type of real protocol for this type of scenario. Um, You know, everybody that I've talked to or has talked about that experience essentially is told that Secret Service came in and, and told people to get out and to get to a secure location and get away from the White House because we don't know where this plane is. So, uh, and this is actually a, you know, this is the image of that day, and you can see things do look a little bit outdated, and this was also then spurred, uh, you know, a new effort to modernize and put in new technology and communication systems uh, in the uh, Presidential Emergency Operations Center. 
Myth number three. Dolly Madison saves the Gilbert Stuart portrait. So we had to read a selection of sources for today's class, and hopefully you did that. Now, who wants, who wants to... You probably all heard the story before. You probably heard it in grade school, in high school. So who, want, who wants to sh- just tell us what you've heard? Alex. That the British were coming in, and they were burning down Washington, D.C. Dolly Madison runs back into the White House with a few people, takes down the Gilbert Stewart portrait, and runs out to save it. Okay, so... In that version of events, you know, Dolly Madison is, it's like a last second thing. She's there. The British are essentially, you know, you can see the British on the horizon. She's about to leave, but she runs back in. It, you know, at least you did acknowledge that there were other people there, but that she was there when they took it off and they sent it away. And right. Now, part of the reason why this story is so popular is because, you know, this was the story that was really put out there after the War of 1812. And And Dolly Madison also played a part in keeping this story alive and well. But it was picked up for children's school books. It was published in a variety of different historiographical um, works. Um, And, you know, it was a story that kept getting perpetuated. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we dig into the sources. So source number one, uh, these were the selected letters of Dolly Payne Madison. And it's Anna Cutts, uh, who's writing to her sister, Dolly Madison, circa August... 23rd, 1814. Remember, the burning takes place on the 24th. I'll put it up on the screen. So, my sister, tell me for God's sake where you are and what you are doing and what you are going to do. I have only time to ask Mr. C to take out the forepart of the carriages, put in the piano, trying to escape, right? Uh, Put in the piano, and anything he can get in there or a wagon if the British are coming. We can hear nothing but what is horrible here. I know not who to send this to, and will say but little. A cuts. So, what do you take away from reading that letter? Maybe how it's written, how it's phrased. Yeah. She's just trying to get as much as she can written to her sister, in that it's going to be short and sweet, and like. I gotta go take Yeah, I mean, you can definitely tell it's very rushed. It also seems like she doesn't really finish entire sentences. They're just sort of like clauses, and then there's a pause, and then she says something else. It's relatively short. She even says, I don't know who to really send this to. Well, she, she just sent it to the White House, but it was, you know, to Dolly Madison, but she wasn't sure if she would be there even. Uh, or she was going to be out with President Madison, who was, uh, at that point, out in the field uh, to watch the Battle of Bladensburg. But, okay, so she doesn't really know. It seems rushed. Okay, that's fair. Now, what about, what about this? Now, you had to read this. This is actually uh, from the National Portrait Gallery of Distinguished Americans, published in 1836, uh, by a D.C. socialite and uh, historian, Margaret Maynard Smith. And what she publishes is based off of Dolly Madison's recollections. So there is no response to this letter. So this is the sister's letter. Dolly Madison always said that she responded, but that letter's lost. There's one story that it was eaten by mice. Uh, There's another story that it was burned. So many years later... 1836, now this is 20 years later, when Margaret Bayard Smith is writing her biography, she asked Dolly Madison, oh, well, can I, can I see the letter? And she says, well, we don't have the letter, but I can, you know, I can give you a copy of what I remember. So this is what she gives her. So again, Tuesday, August 23rd, 1814, Dear sister, my husband left me yesterday morning to join General Winder. He inquired anxiously whether I had courage or firmness to remain in the president's house until his return on the morrow or succeeding day. And on my assurance that I have no fear but for him and success of our army, he left me, beseeching me to take care of myself in the cabinet papers, public and private. Uh, She mentions that she received two dispatches. Uh, The enemy seemed stronger than reported. 
Uh, I am accordingly ready. I have pressed as many cabinet papers into trunks as to fill one carriage. Our private property must be sacrificed. That is impossible to procure wagons for its transportation. The letter goes on and on and on and on. So what do you notice about this letter? Yeah, Alex. I assume she was already planning in advance to make, a, make an escape, and she was already um, packing things away in case the British would come into the White House. So let me ask you this. If this is supposed to be her response to her sister, remember how frantic her sister's letter was. Does this letter seem frantic? Does it seem like it was written after the fact? So now do you start to question whether or not how accurate the narrative is? I mean, just think about it for a moment. If somebody, you know, somebody sends you something and you need to frantically get it done, and then three months later, it's sort of like, all right, tell that story again, but take your time. Walk us through every step. I mean, you're going to add a lot more detail. And by that point in time, this is 1836, the story has become pretty well-versed that Dolly Madison saved the Gilbert Stewart portrait. So at this point, she can't really go back on that, right? She kind of has to align things with how the public has perceived the whole story. Uh, but what's interesting is now, I mean, this letter responds. She goes into Wednesday morning, 12 o'clock. Uh, Since sunrise, I have been turning my spyglass in every direction and watching with unwearied anxiety. Uh, 3 o'clock, would you believe it, my sister? We have a battle of skirmish near Bladensburg, and I am still here within sound of the cannon. Uh, Mr. Madison comes not. May God protect him. Two messengers come with us. That they come to bid me to fly, and I wait for him. At this late hour, a wagon has been procured. I had it filled with the plate and the most valuable po- uh, potable articles belonging to the house. Whether it will reach its destination or fall into the hands of the British, uh, events must determine. Our kind friend, Mr. Carroll, has come to haste in my departure, and I insist on waiting until the large picture of General Washington is secured and it requires to be unscrewed from the wall. This process was found too tedious for these perilous moments. I have ordered the frame to be broken and the canvas taken out. It is done, and the precious portrait placed in the hands of two gentlemen of New York for safekeeping. And now, my dear sister, I, leave, I must leave this house, or the retreating army will make me a prisoner in it by filling up the road, and I am directed to take. Okay, so that's Dolly Madison's version of events. Circa 1836. Yeah, Matthew. I thought it was weird how she said General Washington instead of President Washington. Was it because she knew him when he was general and that's how she thinks of him? Or was it... Well, you, nowadays, we, I think we've become more accustomed to there's president and there's also former president, but also we still sometimes refer to people as President George W. Bush, President Bill Clinton. In those days... This was one of those one of those precedent things that Washington was after is that there should only be one president. So when he left the presidency, he preferred to people address him general. So typically they called him General Washington. Yeah. Okay, so we have the frantic letter from Sister Anna Cutts. We have Dolly Madison's response many years later as she remembers it. So not the actual response from August 23rd or 24th. And then we have this, this newspaper article from the Baltimore Sun, dated May 25th, 1847. So what did, did you find anything interesting about this particular article? Wyndham Hotels and Resorts makes travel possible for all. Whether it's the long haulers looking for a great cup of coffee, a roomier rest for the on-a-whim road trippers, or a place to make summer memories with the whole family. No matter who you are, where you're going, or why, with 24 trusted brands to choose from like La Quinta, Days Inn, and Super 8, your Wyndham is waiting. Get the lowest price at WyndhamHotels.com. Restrictions apply. Visit website for more details. Yeah, Matthew. Was sort of, um, I don't want to say rude, uh, but it was it was a little critical of Dolly Madison because I think the, the best part it's one of the real saviors mm-hmm. uh, when it's talking about the, the people that actually saved the painting, suggesting that she wasn't a real savior. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought it was interesting, a little, a little jab. At sure. Her. And this is 1847, right? So this is 
you know, now we're talking about like 33 years after the actual event, and there's still sort of this scuttlebutt in the newspaper about what exactly happened, who did what, who deserves credit, and it gets to a point where even Dolly Madison, who at this point is quite elderly, um, you know, I think she only lives a couple more years before she passes away in Washington, where she needs to weigh in and sort of, as the article suggests, a historical error is a historical error corrected. Uh, but it talks about General John Mason because a new story had emerged that General John Mason uh, was the one who saved the portrait. And uh, the two gentlemen from New York that Dolly Madison mentions were these guys, uh, Jacob Barker and Robert de Peister. The, these were the two men from New York who did walk into the White House and s- essentially they were responsible for transporting the Gilbert Stewart to safety. So those men were certainly there. That was their account. Dolly Madison agrees with, it was their account. Um, but they do have some minor differences. There's also Daniel Carroll. Remember she mentioned Mr. Carroll? So Daniel Carroll, um, he had gotten more involved in saying that uh, his, his family member who had helped essentially transport Dolly Madison away from the White House also was the one who saved the portrait. So again, we still don't have any clear answer. But what's interesting is Dolly Madison writes a letter to Robert de Peister in February 1848. Again, this is towards the end of her life. And uh, you know, listen to this letter. Dear sir, I did not receive your favor containing the newspapers, and therefore it is my impatience to assure you of my gratitude for the interest you take in my defense in the little narrative of the picture rescue. You will see by the enclosed what is said at the time. The impression that Mr. Carroll saved Stewart's portrait of Washington is erroneous. The paper, which was to accompany your letter, has not reached me, but I have heard that his family believed he rescued it. On the contrary, Mr. Carroll had left me to join Mr. Madison when I directed my servants. So that's an interesting statement. I directed my servants in what manner to remove it from the wall, remaining with them until it was done. So she says she was there until it was done. I saw Mr. Barker and yourself, two gentlemen alluded to, passing, and accepted your offer to assist me in any way by inviting you to help me preserve this portrait, which you kindly carried between you to the humble but safe roof which sheltered it a while. I acted thus because of my respect for General Washington. Not that I felt a desire to gain laurels, but should there be a merit in remaining an hour in danger of life and liberty to save the likeness of anything, the merit in this case belongs to me." Please accept, uh, accept my respect and best wishes. The merit in this case belongs to me. Now, who here has heard of Paul Jennings? Okay, what do you guys remember about Paul Jennings? We talked about Paul Jennings earlier this semester. He was ordered by Dolly Madison to take the portrait. So he is a key player, right? He wrote a biography later on. Yeah, he wrote a... a Recollections, right? Sort of like his, some of his life experiences, but also uh, his experience with the Madisons. So he was born at Montpelier. He, he was born enslaved uh, to the Madisons, and he traveled with them to Washington uh, when the Madisons went there first uh, as, uh, as Secretary of State, but then later as President. Yeah, Jonathan. First White House memoir. He did. So uh, at the time when it was published, uh, essentially during the Civil War, there was you know, some question about how authentic uh, or how accurate this account could be was partially because of his formerly enslaved status, because at that point he was a free African-American man. Uh, It's very similar to what we saw with Elizabeth Keckley, right? Questioning the narrative based on their social status or their their former social status as uh, formerly enslaved people. But Jennings has a very interesting version of the story as well. And that was the last source that you had to read Uh, for today. It's a little bit longer, and it talks about the events of August 24th. So what did you notice about this last source? What did you pick out that was a little bit different from the other sources? Yeah? Uh, It was a a very relaxed day. Mm -hmm. Like, meeting was very relaxed and not rushed. Mm -hmm. It took, like, several hours for the British to come, Um, and there was a lot of meeting. (laughs) <laughs> right, so uh, one of the things that's interesting is because you know Jennings is working to set the table for what they expect to be a victory meal at the president's house, and a messenger rides up and it says, clear out, clear out, um, 
so it certainly gives the impression that the British are, they're on the march and they're, they're going to be at Washington in any minute, right? That's sort of the story. Let's rush. Let's get out of there. But Jennings seems to imply that, well, it took a while for the British to actually get to Washington. And what we know from other accounts is that was true, uh, that the British didn't really reach Washington until about twilight. Uh, and the first place they went was the Capitol to burn that. Uh, so they don't actually burn the president's house until much later that night. Okay, so his version sort of coincides with other eyewitness accounts. Anything else jump out to you about this particular source? Matthew. At the end, uh, at the very end of the source, um, he says that the, the idea that she herself took it down is ridiculous because I think he, yeah, he says she would have needed a ladder to mm-hmm. do it. Um, and he says all she did was get her silver and then run away. And then two, it was the, the gardener and the doorkeeper mm-hmm. were the ones that took it down um, and, and brought it off without her. She wasn't even there. So a very different version of events. Now, why do you think Jennings tells this story in the 1860s? Yeah. Because he didn't want... So, like, at that point, Dolly Madison was more, like, trying to get, again, in the spotlight, it seems. And Mm -hmm. Jennings, after being enslaved by that family for multiple years and most of his life, was kind of tired of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would be, too. Dolly Madison was trying to portray herself in this sort of heroic heroine sense that she actually really wasn't. Hmm. She was any other rich white girl. Well, and let's also keep in mind that after James Madison passes away, he essentially leaves his enslaved people to Dolly Madison. He adds the stipulation that he really doesn't want her to break up families, uh, but she, she does, and she sold Paul Jennings to an insurance salesman named uh, Pollard Webb in D.C., So she does sell Paul Jennings over to someone else. And eventually it's Daniel Webster who actually buys out his debt. And he enters into a work agreement with Jennings that he'll essentially work for Webster and pay off the debt and earn his freedom. So that's how Jennings gets from being enslaved to being free. Now also keep in mind, Dolly Madison, uh, she's been dead for a decade by the time this is published. So he doesn't... This isn't published while she's still alive. I mean, it's, it's very strategically placed later. But there are some interconnections between his account and some of the things she's saying. But then there also are some these unanswered questions, like, well, how would she get a portrait down? Uh, some people say that the portrait was cut out of the frame. Uh, that's not true. They did have to unscrew it from the wall and break the frame. Uh, because when they did conservation work on it, they were able to check and look for any type of serrated edges, and there weren't any. So that really kind of blows a hole in, in that theory. So ultimately, uh, what we end up coming away with is that uh, these, these men, remember, Dolly Madison mentions her servants. And at that time, and oftentimes, people did not use the term slave. They just sort of referred to anybody who worked for them, whether it was for wages or they were owned, as servants. So we don't know necessarily who she's specifically talking about. But when we look at Jennings' account, he mentions Jean Sousset, which is, uh, his real name was Jean-Pierre Soussaint. He was the steward of the White House. And, and uh, Thomas McGraw, who was the gardener. Uh, but those two positions would have been paid. So to use the word servant seems to suggest that perhaps at least one of her enslaved workers was responsible. And Jennings, I mean, he's there. I mean, he's part of that account. He has the eyewitness account. Um, And then uh, de Peister actually says when he labels the people that were there, he mentions servants and, uh, and one of the dining room servants, he says. So ultimately, what we take away from all of this is that okay, Dolly Madison didn't cut out a portrait. She didn't you know, stand up on a ladder and try to remove that portrait herself. I mean, you guys have all seen the Gilbert Stroop portrait in the White House. It's a massive portrait. I mean, you would need a group of people to take it down, right? So like, let's just think about it just in terms of basic physics. You're going to need probably at least three or four people. 
But Dolly Madison, for most of the 19th century, got the lion's share of the credit. Now, since then, we've reevaluated that. Uh, and I usually like to go with Dolly Madison ordered the portrait to be saved. Because you can't deny that she was the one who said, we need to save that portrait. And really, you can kind of think of it as it was really the first major act of art preservation, in a sense, in American history. But you also have to give due to the other people who participated in it. So, if you ever hear anybody talk about Dolly Madison saving the portrait, you can fill them in on all of this background information. Um, and you can tell them, well, it's probably more appropriate to say, ordered to be saved. Um, now, let's think about it from Dolly Madison's perspective. Why perpetuate this story? It looks good for her. Yeah. I think it looks good for her and it also looks good for the president and it tells a triumphant story when the British were attacking Washington, which was obviously a huge embarrassment. And so to have this, yes, it, it does paint her well, but it also shows that the country is, is still going to last past burning at the White House. Okay, so we have it makes Dolly Madison look good. This was obviously a low point for Americans in terms of morale and the war effort. Any other reasons? Let me ask you this. Oh, yeah, Brian. I was just going to say that once the line was sent, like, going back on it, it made it look extremely bad. So she kind of was lost in the fact that once she was given the credit for it, she needed to make sure she was kind of withheld the story so that she didn't get slandered afterwards. Sure. To have less attention towards the White House being burnt down and more focus on something positive. Something more positive. I mean, and that's what Americans needed to hear about. I mean, I just want you to imagine for a moment. Let's let's think about this in today's terms. If a foreign army invaded the United States and burned down Washington D.C., how would you feel? Probably, probably not great. Um, but also, you know, how would you, what would you think of the president who's leading the country at that time and their leadership? So let me ask you this. Close your eyes for a second. Now, when I say James Madison, what's the first thing that pops in your mind? Short guy. Short guy? Constitution. Constitution. Does every, did, did most, who, who, what was the first thing that popped in your head? Constitution. What he did. Okay, university, constitution. And obviously, you know, James Madison deserves credit and his due. Um, but, you know, did any, like, if you asked anybody on the street, you know, oh, yeah, James, James Madison. Yeah, wasn't he president when the city was burned down? Does it, would anybody say that? No. Everybody talks about the Constitution. And it's almost like, in addition to the War of 1812 being sort of a forgotten war, We've also kind of relinquished that, that James Madison was president when the city was destroyed, or nearly destroyed. And I think a big part of it was Dolly Madison's role in building this folklore about saving an important piece of American history. And I think this also probably helped when they were talking about, should we rebuild, should we move somewhere else? You know, it was worth putting themselves at risk to save a piece of American history. If we move away and build a new capital, what does that say about us? And this was a positive story uh, that some, several of you have made that point. You know, the War of 1812 was not a particularly, uh, not a particularly decisive war for the Americans. In fact, a lot of the issues that we still had with the British continued beyond the war. Um, but we don't really remember that part. It seems like when you mention the War of 1812, people remember Dolly Madison and the saving of the Gilbert's true portrait. This is, and this is probably the, in, in my time being a White House historian, this is the one that has been hardest to try to untangle um, from popular culture because it's everywhere. So, again, if you run into somebody to talk about Dolly Madison and the burning of the White House, you can tell them more about the correspondence and when it was dated and it was a recollection and it was a memory and, it, and so on and so on. All right, let's shift gears to the White House alligator. Um, 
Not much of a transition in between, but uh, the story goes that President John Quincy Adams received a pet alligator from the Marquis de Lafayette uh, when he did his grand tour of the United States in 1824-25. Now, when he visited the White House the first time in 1824, James Monroe was president, and then he visited it again uh, for a birthday celebration in September for himself. Uh, September 1825, John Quincy Adams threw uh, a birthday uh, ball and reception for him at the White House. And there's this story that uh, he presented... John Adams, uh, John Quincy Adams, with an alligator. And that John Quincy Adams, not really knowing what to do with that, essentially just put the alligator in the East Room. Uh, and that, that was just where, I guess that's where alligators are stored. Um, because at that point in time, remember, the East Room wasn't finished yet. It was sort of a storage space. So it's like, okay, well, I guess that part sort of holds up. Uh, but if you know anything about John Quincy Adams, he was meticulous with his note-taking and his diaries And he was the kind of guy that when he went for a walk in the city, he would identify plants and trees and flowers and then try to remember their Latin names. And he would record them. It was a way that he was teaching himself the Latin names of of plants and and trees. So I, I find it hard to believe that John Quincy Adams wouldn't have mentioned in his diaries that he received an alligator. It seems like a pretty, pretty standout event. Right? But let's keep digging. Auguste, Le, uh, Auguste Levasseur, who was Lafayette's secretary and later published an account of the travels and what they saw and what they did, he mentions seeing alligators during their voyage to Savannah in March 1825. So then you're like, okay, so they did see alligators. It's possible. They went to Savannah. Maybe they captured one of those small baby alligators and then they brought it to the White House. Well, that's a pretty big gap between March and September. So what were they doing with an alligator for six months? Okay, that doesn't really make much sense. But what I found when I was doing a little bit more research into this particular myth, I couldn't find any newspaper accounts related to it, but what I did find uh, was this 1888 children's magazine called Wide Awake by Harriet Taylor Upton. And what it said was, uh, and this is a quote from that particular Uh, article. When General Lafayette made his visit there, this famous East Room was given up to him to deposit the many curiosities sent him, some live alligators being among them. So really in 1888, that's really sort of the first published instance of alligators in the East Room. That's about, what, 60-some years after Lafayette actually visited. And this is actually an article from the Evening Star uh, from 1867, and it mentions a uh, Mr. John Thecker's grocery store in Georgetown. And you can see it's, uh, it says, The Crocodile Excitement. The alligator at Mr. John Thecker's grocery store, mention of which was made in yesterday's Star, created quite an excitement in town, and many have today called to see it. So there were people that were putting alligators in stores uh, in D.C. in the late 1860s. So is it possible that one of these stories just sort of morphed from that? Probably. There's really no evidence that there were alligators in the East Room. So I consider that to be a pretty big myth. Myth number five, Theodore Roosevelt and Christmas trees. Has anybody heard of this story before? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was going to... What do you know about the story? Or what do you you remember hearing about it? Um... I don't really remember, like, the full story. All I know is that the Christmas trees is mostly a Germanic tradition Mm -hmm. that was taken over to the United States. That's just what my family has told me, but they're also German, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the the whole idea of putting a Christmas tree in your house is a much more modern tradition. Uh, In fact, the first documented instance of a Christmas tree at the White House is uh, during the Benjamin Harrison administration in 1889. So, I mean, that tells you that the first documented instance was much later. Uh, It's, of course, become much more consistent in the 20th and 21st centuries. And, of course, now we have annual Christmas decorations, and we have the Christmas tree lighting and the Christmas tree in the blue room, which is a lot more compared to, you know, what the presidents in the late 19th century did. Oftentimes what they did, if they had anything, would have been a small tree up on the second floor in the private quarters. They really didn't put things on the state floor. Uh, because that's where people were constantly going. 
But the story goes that Theodore Roosevelt, because he was such a big conservationist, did not believe in cutting down Christmas trees. And that's why the Roosevelts didn't have Christmas trees. Uh, And so the story goes uh, that one of the Roosevelt boys, uh, Archie, snuck a Christmas tree up into the White House and he put it in the closet in one of the upstairs rooms and decorated it. And of course, this is then later the, the image that sort of captures the story that uh, it was Archie who brought Christmas to the White House. Uh, and even though President Roosevelt you know, didn't believe in cutting down trees, he let this one slide. Uh, so goes the story. Now, Roosevelt was on record opposing destructive lumbering practices, but he never appears to have singled out the practice of harvesting Christmas trees. It's worth noting that one of the people he worked with, uh, Chief Forester uh, uh, Pinoch, actually saw nothing wrong with the practice and by 1907 was even urging the creation of businesses specifically for growing Christmas trees. A few contemporary newspapers note how family tradition held the Roosevelts actually never had a Christmas tree. It was expected that Roosevelt, the father of six children when he was president, would have a tree in the White House despite this, but he never did just because the Roosevelts didn't celebrate Christmas with a tree. Uh, To the earlier point, some families did and some families didn't. So there was no ban. Some people say Roosevelt banned trees. It just wasn't something that how the Roosevelts celebrated Christmas, actually. Now, Archie changed that in 1907. Uh, The president got a kick out of it, and he let his son continue to do it. But this whole idea that there was a ban on Christmas trees is a myth. Here's an image of uh, one of the earliest renditions of a Christmas tree. This is actually upstairs in what is today the yellow oval room on the second floor. And of course, this is the tradition today now with the annual Christmas tree in the blue room. Uh, It's been consistently in the blue room since 1961 when the Kennedys started that tradition. There were two times when it was moved elsewhere, 1962, when they were refurbishing and renovating the Blue Room. And then in 1969, the Nixons actually moved it out to the entrance hall. But other than those two years since 1961, this has always been in the Blue Room. Yeah, William. Uh, how about that like, video that recently came out with Melania decorating the White House? Mm-hmm. There's like trees all over the White mm-hmm. House. Like, Great question, because this was actually something I was just asked by someone else, so I know the answer. Um, I would say up up to the Eisenhowers, typically what most families did was they had a Christmas tree up in the residence, and then there was a large Christmas tree in the East Room. Of course, the East Room is the tallest room, and that's usually where they would put an 18-foot, 20-foot tree. And a lot of presidents just did this practice because it made the most sense. If you were going to do Christmas receptions or parties, you do it in the East Room. It's the biggest space. And usually they did have annual receptions for White House staff as well. Um, The first instance of a tree in the Blue Room is actually 1912. The Tafts are the first one to do it. But it doesn't become a consistent thing until the Kennedys. Now, when we get to the Eisenhowers, Mamie Eisenhower loved to decorate for holidays. And she's really the first one that really jumps into Halloween. Uh, So like the annual Halloween celebration that you probably remember reading about uh, really kicks off with her. But she also loved Christmas. And all of a sudden, the White House went from having maybe a few trees to uh, I think one year they had 16 trees. And then the next, uh, towards the end of the Eisenhower administration, they had 29 trees, which is a lot. But uh, I know last year, the Trumps had 81 trees. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's grown, you know, ever since the Eisenhowers, where all of a sudden now Christmas decorations are not just isolated to the quarters, and they're not just in the East Room. I mean, they're everywhere. They're on the outside of the White House. They're all over the state floor. They're on the ground floor. They're in the East Wing. Uh, they're in the West Wing. Um, so we've really seen the expansion of, of how the first families and, uh, and staff decorate for the holidays since the Eisenhowers. Yes, Alex. Um, who is in charge, um, or who has been in charge in the past of uh, decorating? And is it the Historical Association, the curators, or the First Lady, or a whole bunch of people? So all that is done internally. Uh, so I would say primarily a lot of the decoration is overseen by the Office of the First Lady. So you're going to be talking about the East Wayne staff primarily. 
uh, right after Thanksgiving is when they have uh, they have these volunteers. Usually, you're, you're talking about upwards of 500 people who will come to the White House and they'll help decorate. And they get all those decorations done right after Thanksgiving, and then they reveal the decorations usually the next week. So they they need to have this yeah. So they need to have it pretty much orchestrated, planned, organized, and then be able to have all those people turn it around and get all these decorations ready by the following week. Um, and the decorations themselves, uh, they either end up with the presidential libraries or they go off to the executive support facility. Now, sometimes um, one, of the, one of the things that people often wonder is, well, are they buying new decorations every year? Or sometimes they will repurpose previous year's decorations. You know, they can change the ornaments, they can uh, change the colors, uh, but sometimes they do use, uh, they do get new decorations as well. Okay. Myth number six, the naming of the White House. Have you heard this one? Who does it, who named, who called it the White House? Awesome. I believe it was Theodore Roosevelt that used it in stationery for the first time. So the, so the story goes, and you can find this online pretty much everywhere, that it was, it was President Theodore Roosevelt who officially changed the name of Executive Mansion to the White House. Even though, as we've already covered, people were sort of referring to it as the White House because it had that lime-based whitewash, but it wasn't like an official name change. And, uh, and here, of course, this is a, one of the instances that I was able to locate. So... Uh, what you have is uh, on one side, on the left side, that is the Executive Mansion Washington Stationery. You can see that's September 1901, and uh, and that's later, uh, that's November 1901. So there's that gap in that month of October, right? Uh, what do you notice about the paper on the left? Anything in particular that stand out to you? How is it different? I mean, besides Executive Mansion and White House. Yeah. Uh, the one on the left is signed by the Secretary to the President. The one on the right is signed by the President. Okay, that's one of the differences. Yeah. There's blueprint on the one on the left. Mm -hmm. There's like a darker, maybe black print on the right. Okay, so we have different signatures, obviously, who signed it. Different color fonts, still typewritten. Yep. The color of the paper itself. Okay, different color paper. Yeah. There's more wording on the paper on the right than on the left. You guys are finding all these great differences, but I'm looking for the one big one. What about the outside of it? What is, the, does anybody know what that is? The border. The border, yeah, what is it? Black. Black. Yes, but I mean, <laughs> why, why does, so why, why does this, Letter of presidential correspondence. Why does it? Why does it have black trim around it? Any ideas? Easier to send. I don't know. It's free mail when it's government. So, oh. no. You know, teach their own. What just happened in September 1901? Oh. Oh wait. Sorry, I'm thinking. Oh, about, so sorry, you're I'm so thinking, close. No, I'm thinking about like the black hand. That's a totally different thing. That is a totally different thing. I, I, I think. Was it? No, nope. yeah, that's, that's later. Oh. President McKinley just died. President McKinley just oh, yeah. died oh. in September 1901. Remember, he's assassinated, and then he kind of lingers for a while, and then he, they think he's getting better, and then it turns out uh, he has a terrible infection, and he dies. And usually what you have is a, a month of mourning. Um, so all of the stationery that's used at the White House for that month is going to look like that. Right? So you have the black trim, uh, Executive Mansion, Washington in black. And this we, we call this morning paper. Right? Is that really an effective morning method? Just making your stationery have a black border? It was what people did. And bright blue ink definitely screams morning. Okay, so we know in, <laughs> I, we know in September, late September 1901, they're using this morning paper which must have been made shortly after McKinley died, and they used it. And then in early February, 
we move to the White House. So that tells us, okay, so October 1901, something happened between those two. So here's another good example. Uh, this is actually a document. It's in the National Archives. And again, what do you see on the... We see the trim, right? We see the morning paper. We see Executive Mansion in black. But it says, My dear sir, uh, I was directed by the President to bring your attention the desire to change the headings or datelines of all official papers and documents requiring his signature from Executive Mansion to White House. In view of the approaching session of Congress, it will become necessary in preparing nominations for the Senate as well as messages for either House of Congress to observe the above change. Very truly yours, George Bruce Cordelieu, Secretary to the President. And the letter is dated October 17, 1901. So we have the President's Secretary telling the Secretary of State, for future reference, any documents you send to the President for him to sign and are official documents, the heading should be White House. You can still collect my morning paper today. <laughs> of course you can. Because it's a thing. Wait. So, 20 bucks on Amazon. <laughs> so October 17th, 1901, that's when that directive is sent. But there is really no executive order. There's no law. So when they say that Roosevelt officially changed the name from Executive Mansion to White House, it is true, but it's kind of hard to pin down exactly when it happened. We know it's October 1901, but is it when they start sending those letters out? Is it when the other department... I mean, there's only one letter to the Secretary of State. Did everybody else just fall into line about a week later? I don't know. Uh, but there's more to the story there. Again, and this is part of the reason why people just say October 1901, because we're not quite sure about the exact date. Okay. Myth number seven, Lincoln bed in the Lincoln bedroom. Uh, so this is actually a painting that was done by an artist named Peter Waddell. He did a series of these historic portraits that show different moments in White House history and, uh, and obviously then sort of how the White House was decorated at certain moments. And, uh, and this is supposed to be a picture of what is today the, the Lincoln bedroom. Now in Lincoln's time, it was his cabinet room in his office. So if you've seen the movie, uh, if you've seen the movie Lincoln, you know you probably remember that space. There were maps uh, on the wall. He had his desk. He had a large rectangular table right in the middle, and that's usually where the cabinet gathered. So he actually used the Lincoln bedroom space as his office and the cabinet room. But just pay attention to these details and what it looks like uh, because it changed pretty rapidly over time. Now, one of the first visiting foreign dignitaries to come to the White House uh, was Prince Albert. And when he came to the White House during the Lincoln administration, the White House didn't even really have a guest suite. They just had sort of a spare room with a bunch of different furniture in it. So one of the things that Mary Todd Lincoln does is she purchases a specific suite of furniture for this new room that's supposed to be for a visiting uh, head of state or dignitary. Yeah. Um, isn't it said that like, there were ghost sightings in Lincoln's room? We'll get to that, yeah, because the Lincoln bedroom is supposedly very haunted. Um, I think it was President Reagan's dog yeah. who wouldn't cross the threshold and go into the room. Um, so that's, again, one of those stories. Now, here's the Lincoln bedroom. Uh, this is a little bit later, um, probably in the late 19th century. So it is still a bedroom at that time. And actually, some of the presidents used this furniture for their own presidential suites. So that's what it looked like in Lincoln's time. Here you can see this is the suite of furniture uh, that Mary Todd Lincoln purchased. The chairs, the table, but the bed in particular. It's often called the Lincoln bed. Now, part of the reason they call it the Lincoln bed is because it's eight feet long and it's six feet wide. So it's a pretty big bed. And most people just assumed, well, the bed is eight feet long, so... President Abraham Lincoln must have slept in it, right? He did not. It was supposed to be for visiting uh, distinguished guests. So even though it's called the Lincoln bed, he didn't actually sleep in it. But there were presidents who did. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Calvin Coolidge, they all moved this bed into their own presidential bedrooms, and they used it. So other presidents have used it, just not Lincoln. Now Truman uh, repurposes the space as the Lincoln bedroom post-renovation, and he puts Lincoln-era objects and memorabilia in there. 
Uh, so it, it looks more like this. Uh, so keep in mind Lincoln's time. Uh, this is the late 19th century being used as a bedroom. Uh, and then later, the space is used as sort of like a private office for the president. Um, and this is primarily where the presidents work until the building of the West Wing. Uh, today, we call it the Treaty Room. Uh, it was between the Treaty Room and the Lincoln Bedroom. Those were two the, the two spaces that presidents often used for their office and their cabinet rooms. Uh, this is a little bit later. I think this is during the Wilson administration. But again, you can see the Lincoln bed being used there. Um, and I think this is actually during the Coolidge. Or actually, no, this is later. I think this is during Truman. Uh, but eventually we get to this moment in time where uh, Truman, who is obviously very interested in American history, he learns the lore behind this, that there are these objects in the White House. Uh, remember, we don't have an official collection yet. It's just sort of things that are in the house that have some association or affiliation with Abraham Lincoln. So what he decides to do is designate a space on the second floor as the Lincoln bedroom. Up to that point in time, there was the Lincoln study, the Lincoln room, but it's with Truman when it really becomes a guest bedroom, the Lincoln bedroom. And it pretty much stayed the same uh, from Truman up until the association funded a major refurbishing and renovation project uh, during the George W. Bush administration. And this was a big thing that Laura Bush really wanted to do, was that she wanted the space, yes, it could still be the Lincoln bedroom and it can still house the furniture that Mrs. Lincoln purchased, but she wanted the, the interiors, the carpeting, the walls, to reflect more what the room looked like in Lincoln's time. So again, here you can see, I think this is later during Nixon, Clinton, and then Bush. Uh, one of the things that we had to do was uh, do the research in the background on uh, this bed canopy. So you can actually see from the images it disappears uh, because at some point it was lost. We just don't know what happened to it. Uh, here it is in the late 1890s. You can see it there at the top. So what we had to do was essentially use photographs and do more research to try to create a reproduction as similar as possible. But there is the Lincoln bedroom uh, in the Lincoln bed and the accompanying furniture. So, just a quick recap. The White House wasn't painted white to cover the burn marks, but because whitewash had been used beforehand and had become the accustomed color, that was why people often refer to it as the White House. Andrew Jackson likely never planted the famous magnolia tree. Uh, Only later did an underground White House emerge beneath the building. The Marquis de Lafayette never put an alligator in the East Room. Roosevelt never banned Christmas trees. That wasn't a real thing. Uh, People had been calling the White House the White House well before Roosevelt ordered a new official stationery. And Lincoln never slept in the bed named after him. But probably the biggest one, Dolly Madison did not save the painting by herself, but she ordered it to be saved, and it was through the collective efforts of several people, including at least one enslaved man, Paul Jennings, that this was done. So what do these myths tell us about the White House? Now, because of the White House's rich and deep history, the conditions are optimal for inventing presidential and first lady lore and legends. But as we see with the Gilbert Stewart example, history is often complicated and complex. There is always more to the story than meets the eye. There are more agents, there's more factors and variables involved, interests and motivations. And at the same time, these myths are incredibly difficult to untangle from our popular culture and the public conscious. The fact that many of these tales persist still today tells us more about how Americans have approached, understood, invented, and shared history and historical anecdotes in many different ways. These traditions themselves underscore a deeper truth about what it means to be an American, that we are constantly defining and redefining who we are as a people. and attempting to ground those constantly shifting realities within the confines of our shared national past. Myths can indeed serve the greater good, generating more interest in history, promote civic engagement and education, as well as compel individuals to critically analyze the historical record for more answers, like we did with Dolly Madison's correspondence today. But it can also be extremely detrimental, furthering falsehoods or mischaracterizations that are harnessed, manipulated, or distorted for a variety of purposes. The key is to use your learned skills in this course as a lens to understanding the world around you. That's part of the reason why I showed those media accounts by CNN and Washington Post and 
uh, and the New York Post, so that even when people are talking about history, you have to be very aware of the sources and who's writing and for what audience, and it's no different than when we study history. The key is to use these skills. Only then will you see how powerful and prolific myth-making can be and how it's been at the epicenter of our American identity ever since the American Revolution. Any questions about White House myths or anything you took away in particular about some of the stories we heard? Yeah. No? Christopher? I didn't know that the Bush family renovated the Lincoln bedroom to, or restored it, I know. Yeah, I mean, the, the Bushes actually did quite a bit of work in the White House, but that was one of the big projects because, generally speaking, the association does get more involved in things that are more on the state floor because those are the public rooms. Those are the rooms that people see on tours. Uh, and those are the rooms that stay fairly consistent in terms of changing things and, and having the association assist in that. But because the Lincoln bedroom's up in the residence, there's different rules. Now, because the Lincoln bedroom has, is one of the most famous spaces of the White House, you know, we made a very compelling case that this is something that should be done and needs to be done. And uh, the Committee for the Preservation of the White House agreed. Yeah? they get government funding a little bit? Or? Um, generally speaking, for those types of projects, no. I mean, really, government money goes towards maintenance, basic upkeep, necessary renovations, uh, you know, like the Truman renovation, obviously, that was a necessary renovation. But, you know, the types of things where it's, it's more cosmetic or you want to change the look of a room, uh, those things have to be privately funded. Yeah, Will. Um, this isn't about one of the myths that you showed us, but it is about a possible White House myth. Um, is it true that President Zachary Taylor never voted in any election, including his own? That sounds right, but I'm not positive. Yeah. Okay. So, there's Boy. some... It's not an okay. Okay, so there's some myths that say that Abraham Lincoln was bisexual. Hmm. Do you think that there's have some based uh, in does that co- does that qualify as a myth? Because like some of them, or is it like, just a claim? Some were brought in like newspapers. Like mm-hmm. one of them was a bodyguard. Another one was like one of his very close friends. So who visited? Oh, the wasn't White House it wasn't quite it, wasn't it like uh, you know because Lincoln was a traveling lawyer? That, you know, because sometimes he had to share a bed with a man that some people have said, like, oh, yeah, then that's, that's who he was. Uh, think about it. In those days, you know, people didn't get their own rooms. <laughs> you know, we get our own hotel rooms today. That wasn't a thing in the 19th century. You split costs. That means you shared beds. That's just the way it worked. Yeah. What do you know about um, where the Gilbert Stewart portrait was when the White House was being refurbished and burned mm-hmm. down the original for the first time? between when it left the White House and then when did it get back? So, and let's also, we can fill in a little bit more credit to Dolly Madison here because Dolly Madison does secure some of the silver pieces. She does take her, um, the papers that her husband leaves behind because she doesn't want those to be captured. Um, And she also uh, takes the red velvet curtains from what is today the Blue Room. She she takes the curtains with her too. Um, We know that it seems likely based on other eyewitness accounts that Jennings was right that uh, there was looting at the White House, but it was probably Americans uh, who, who were in a panic frenzy and they, they were on their way out of the city anyway. And some of them did swing by the White House and grab some things. Um, so Dolly Masson does get some credit there. The Gilbert Stewart portrait uh, was put on a wagon and Pacer and Barker got it out of the city. Uh, and my understanding was they hid it in a barn in Maryland. And they kept it there. They let the property owner know it was there, and it stayed there until the British left. And then they brought it back to the city uh, and gave it to the Secretary of State, who was uh, James Monroe at that time. So it, it's away from the White House for a little bit. Obviously, you can't go back to the White House because it's burned out. Uh, but it eventually, it, it goes back in then in time uh, when James Monroe moves in as president in his own right in late 1817. Yeah, um, you mentioned White House tunnels as like uh, White House security myths, mm-hmm. but the biggest myth that I ever heard was that there really was no red phone that connected the Moscow that a lot of people claimed that Cold War presidents had. Hmm. Like, do you know like anything? Well, I know Johnson had like the, that teletype machine, so that was one way that they were constantly communicating with the Russians. Um, when they were planting the Rose Garden in 62, 
uh, they had one of those strategic air command phones, uh, and that when they were planting and digging, they actually severed the line. <laughs> uh, so immediately, like, alarms started going off, like, because they were like, oh, my God, like, did something happen to the White House? Like, did the, what happened to the, was it, they just cut the phone line by accident, so... But there was, like, no, like, physical red phone that a lot of people said there was? I don't think so. I mean, I don't remember seeing that. I mean, it, it, um, they, would ha- they would have been able to con- connect with their counterparts in Moscow. Uh, I don't think they needed a specific phone just for that. Uh, but that's something I'd, ha- I'd have to double-check. But it, it doesn't sound right to me. Yeah? What are some of the accounts of the haunting... Ooh, right. Ghost stories, right. So we just had Halloween, and uh, there's been a number of ghost stories. Now, I'm not going to ask what your opinions are, if you believe in ghosts or you don't believe in ghosts. Some people do, some people don't. Uh, And you remember when we had Bill Ullman, the White House curator. I mean, he worked at the White House for 40 years, and he was like, oh, I had no experiences, I don't believe in them, et cetera, et cetera. But some of the other ones, uh, there's one story about um, the ghost of a, what looks like a, a young boy, a teenage boy, and he was called The Thing. Uh, and that was during the Taft administration. Archibald Butt talks about uh, that story of, like, there was... People said that, like, they saw this boy and that, you know... And, uh, and the Taft basically told his staff, like, do not let this leak to the press. Like, this is ridiculous. And, you know, we're not going to talk about it, basically. Uh, there's stories of a... Some people say that they've seen a specter of a British soldier carrying a torch, um, that David Burns, the original landowner that the White House is built on, that he shows up and, and, uh, and cackles and laughs here and there. Andrew Jackson, the same. It seems like Abraham, everybody saw Abraham Lincoln's ghost. Uh, Churchill, that was probably one of the, and maybe you've heard that story, uh, Churchill was actually uh, naked at the time. And he was sort of like, Mr. President, you've caught me exposed. And then, and then it was like the Lincoln ghost kind of smirked, and then he disappeared. Um, so there, there's all these different stories about... There, there's also... Uh, so during Truman's time, Truman believed the house was haunted. And he talked about... Uh, what He said he could hear footsteps. He said sometimes the chandeliers would just start swaying... Uh, and that sometimes he would even be in bed, and all of a sudden he would hear like, like pounding at his door. And he would get up, he would go to the door, he'd open it, and there was nobody there. So there were all these unexplained noises and phenomenon that Truman experienced, and he believed the White House was haunted. Yeah? Not the case. It turns out that, that was before the renovation, right? Like, yes. Like, it turns out that that was just because the, the White House was so shoddy at that point, so things were creaking, things were falling apart in the, in the infrastructure, a piano leg threw, uh, fell through one of the, the floors, and that's how they discovered uh, that, that it was time to... Yeah, I mean, like, the idea that the chandelier just started swaying? Yeah. Well, I mean, that was because, like, some of the chandeliers were literally pulling the floor down. Yeah. And remember, a lot of the interior structure was made of wood. So, I mean, I've always thought that that loud banging noise, that could have been, like, wood struts literally popping. Because yeah. remember, in 1927, when Cal Coolidge adds a new roof, it's made of steel and concrete, and all that weight is put on that old wood, you're going to start hearing noises. And not normal noises. It's the White House was literally crying out in pain because of the weight it was carrying. Yeah? And I, th- I think, uh, not to you know, go too far with this, but I think Truman probably had enough ghosts of himself, his own after you know having to deal with dropping you know the, the bombs on, on Japan twice and kind of having to reconcile with how he ended the war and that kind of thing, I think President Truman had a lot of um, his own like demons inside of him that he had to reconcile hmm. whether or not that was fair. Well, yeah, I mean, and it, it, my general understanding is that I haven't really heard much about ghost stories since the renovation. So that's my my other argument to that point is that these stories are constantly in the press or people talk about experiencing unexplained things and but it seems like a lot of these stories go right up to about 1952 and then you don't really hear a whole lot after that i mean there's the the story about i think it was president reagan's dog wouldn't go in the lincoln bedroom it just stood outside the door and just would bark but i mean like 
I'm sure some of you have dogs like that. I have a dog like that. It's, I don't think that's necessarily it's haunted. It's just you just have a dog like that. Yeah. Some people say they see like the ghost of Willie Lincoln. Willie Lincoln is another one. That he died in. Do you think that that is like a possibility? Like, well, I mean, like, do I, not really so like a do I believe in ghosts then, or? Well, well, I'm just saying, like, has the, you know what? Never mind. <laughs> what I would say is, as a historian who's supposed to look at evidence and documentation, I think that a lot of these things probably, probably aren't real. At the same time, I know there's been so many instances where people they experience something that they can't explain. So it's possible. I'm not going to take a definitive stance and no, they don't exist. Um, so I think it's just one of those things that depends on your experiences. Have you seen a ghost in the White House? I have not. No. That's why I'm leaning that way. I haven't. Like Bill Ullman, who, who literally worked there for 40 years, and he never had any type of those experiences. So, Yeah, Daniel. Uh, question about the passage connecting White House to the Treasury Department. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it true that Secret Service can uh, or stop Lincoln B. Johnson from going using that as a shortcut? And was that the same passage that, uh, I don't know, maybe on the media that um, Bill Clinton used to meet up with Monica Lewinsky? Well, my understanding is that Monica Lewinsky was the White House intern. So I, I don't I think she still owns the dress. I don't think, I don't think she needed to sneak through a tunnel. I mean, she probably had a pass. Um, my guess is presidents have used those tunnels like if they want to get away from the White House and not be seen. Because remember, also keep in mind when we talked about the growth of media and press coverage, I mean, the president leaves the White House, it immediately becomes news. I mean, even think about when President Trump left the White House to go to Walter Reed, and that became an immediate story. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure there were certainly instances where they did use that tunnel, uh, but I, I would think it was not a regular occurrence. Alex. You're next, Alex. Okay, uh, two quick things. Uh, first, I just wanted to know, is um, uh, Roosevelt's Secretary of State, John Hay, the same John Hay that worked for Lincoln? E- I believe so, yes. Okay. Uh, and secondly, could you speak to, there are a lot of stories that um, uh, President Kennedy would just sneak a bunch of mistresses into yeah. the White House. He's going to ask about Monroe and Kennedy. Mm. You know? Who was that it's class? not. It's not really. Yeah, you did say that before class. Um, I can certainly recommend books if you'd like to read those. Um, but generally speaking, I don't get too bogged down in personal lives. You started the trend with the interns, I guess. Hmm. Did you? So that was your question too. Hmm. I mean, my own personal opinion is that yeah, I don't. Now, okay, now we're wandering into crazy land, so let's, we'll pull it back a little bit. What? It was in people. No. Oh, well, then it must be true. <laughs> oh, it was, in, it was in CNN. It must be true. It was, oh, it was in Washington Post. It must be true. What, I, what I'm, my point is, and what I want you to take away from this class, is that you should always be asking questions. You should always be looking at evidence. Don't just accept something at face value because it's put out by this media outlet or this historian. You know, dig deeper. Form your own conclusions. It's important to think about these things and not just accept things. Yeah, Brian. Um, just like really into the holidays or something. Like that. Something like that. <laughs> that's a lot. Well, I, I mean, I feel like that's probably more Mrs. Trump. Because she's the one who does the decorating. But I mean, that's what I mean, first ladies generally have. They've overseen that part of it. Yeah. No, I mean, well, let's see. If we go back, the Eisenhowers were up to, they were in the 20s. Uh, I think the Bushes and the Clintons were up in the 30s. So, I mean, it is, it is higher, but I mean, the White House is a big place, right? So it's easy to decorate it with trees all on the entire public tour. Yeah. Did Washington have wooden dentures? Is that true? No. No? No. Okay. He had, no, he didn't. <laughs> yeah, he did. So uh, the, set, the set of complete dentures that I believe Mount Vernon has, 
They were made out of metal. And the teeth that were in there were actually human teeth and sometimes animal teeth. Ooh. Yep. And, and sometimes the teeth sometimes the teeth came from overseers. Sometimes they came from his own enslaved people. What? Yep. Yeah. I believe he paid for them. Okay. But still. That's still that's yeah, William. Uh, you talked about questioning a lot of stuff and like White House stuff, like not to take stuff at face value. Is there any essential parts of White House history that no one should question? Like there shouldn't be any questions at all and just accept it? Anything I say. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, that's a good point. Um, Obviously, there are a lot of things that we can factually say and prove and we have evidence of. Um, but, I mean, I can even say in my experience in this job, I mean, I'm constantly finding things that slightly change the narrative or add a different layer of complexity that has been there or what people have presented before. And that's the thing about the White House. I mean... It, it encapsulates all these different relationships and interactions and people, and we're always learning new things. And the same principle should apply you know, when you're in other classes, when you're working internships or jobs, that you need to have that same approach to not take anything at face value. You know, think hard about the evidence, think critically, and you know, form your own opinions. You know, ju- just don't accept someone else's. And that includes me. Yeah, Alex. Uh, I know many presidents, uh, family members, and pets have died on the White House, in the White House. Um, are any of them buried in the White House grounds? Family members or family member pets? Any, any living things that were buried in the White House? I mean, I, I'm sure it's... <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> I, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's possible. But I, to be honest, nobody has ever directly asked me how many, you know, what pets have died in the White House and have been buried there. Well, so, are there any people? Like any, are there any grave sites on the White House grounds? Or? Not that we know of. So, right before they were building the White House, there actually used to be a cemetery in Lafayette Park, um, and they had to dig up the graves and and <laughs> move the that's, that's move the coffins and move the tombstones and. That's um, now, there is some reason to suggest that there could be people buried on the grounds. Um, the, the best instance I can think of is uh, one of Jefferson's enslaved cooks who gave birth to a child. Actually, the first, she gave birth to the first child born in the White House, not Jefferson's granddaughter. Uh, everybody says Jefferson. I guess if you say the first child related to a president born in the White House. But actually, it was one of his cooks. And, um, and one of these babies got really sick. And we know based on Jefferson's account books that he paid a doctor for multiple visits. And then we also know later that he paid out a man to make a small coffin. So, you know, I don't think they would have gone back to Monticello. Uh, I think they probably would have buried the enslaved baby on the ground somewhere. But as far as I know, I haven't seen, there's no, there's no reference, no other references beyond just they built a coffin. So did the baby go back to Monticello? Was the baby buried somewhere else in D.C.? Was the baby buried on the grounds? We just don't know. Yeah, Madison. Cadaver dog. Hmm? To, find, to see if it's true. Cadaver dog. Like, you know, one of those dogs that sniffed out first. Well, this is, you know, 210 years ago. Yeah, they but I also think that, you know, between the renovations and the digging up of the White House grounds, I mean, they prob- if, if they did, maybe they would have found something by then. But we, don't, we just don't know for sure. Yeah, Sarah. Um, what's your favorite, like, personal favorite, like, White House myth and or White House conspiracy theory that you've got? That's a good question. Because I'm just like, I figure, like, working at the White House Historic Association, you probably get weird people emailing you with their theories. All the time. <laughs> you have any good ones? What is, what are the most oh, science, sort of like, what is, like, some of the, f- like, yeah. best, best moments? Yeah. Um, I mean, oftentimes you, people will write in and they'll say, 
Uh, you know, I was always led to believe that my great great grandfather worked in the Rutherford B. Hayes White House and was very close with the president and was an advisor. Can you tell me more about that person? And, you know, we just don't have the records. Um, so, oftentimes, disappointingly, we have to direct them to the National Archives, the Library of Congress, or the Hayes Library in this instance. Um, a, n- a number of people write and they want us to authenticate things which we don't do. And they, want, they, you know, they essentially want us to be able to tell them, yes, that was in the White House. And obviously, yeah, I get it. It's, maybe it's a personal memento, but also, we don't know. They might be thinking about selling it at auction. And to have the association stamp of approval, they think that'll probably help you know, give it a little bit more juice. Um, yeah, I mean, those, those types of things, I just don't even try to really... Because it's one of those things where if you if you make the choice to respond, it's probably going to keep going. So you have to be very careful about what you respond to and what you don't respond to. Yeah, William. Uh, going off of that, have you ever been contacted by like the Pawn Stars team? Because I heard they verify White House stuff. I have not, but that would be great. I would love to talk. I would love to talk to was it Rick Chumley? Chumley. <laughs> Chumley. <laughs> No, he's yeah. dead. Wait, Charlie's no, dead? Grandpa. No, no, big No, Grandpa. Oh, okay, I was grandpa. worried. But that's still a different he's guy. He's too young to die. He went to prison. He's a cool match. I will say, though, that, I mean, there are some, some times where people do have some interesting things, and even though we don't authenticate it, we're able to connect them with people who specialize in a particular period of furniture or light fixtures, and sometimes it turns out, yeah, these, these were from the White House. So that stuff is still out there. People are still finding it. Um, it was a big part of why I thought the White House artifact assignment would be fun, but also would give us a better sense of what is out there and maybe what the association should see what it can do in terms of returning it to the collection. Any other questions? Well, I just want to thank you all for a great semester. And... It's hard, to, it's hard to believe that it's gone this quickly, um, but I appreciate you putting up with me, and uh, it's been fun, but uh, you know, we'll obviously stay in touch. If you need anything, you can always reach me by email, and uh, I'll get the rest of the papers done. I do have a parting gift uh, for all of you. So in boxes over there, um, I have 20 copies of one of our books. Uh, We did a book on the executive mansions of the world. So obviously, the White House is one of them, uh, but then you have Buckingham Palace is one of them, and uh, the presidential house in in Paris is one. Um, So it's our gift to you. And uh, as you're walking out, feel free to grab a copy. And uh, we'll be in touch in the next week. Uh, If there's anything else I can help with, remember, uh, just email me your final version of the paper, and that way I can do the grading that way. Yes? There is no final. final. Just the research paper. Right. So, any other questions, final statements? Anybody feel like they really need to get something out? They need to share something? No, you had, but you had plenty. You you shared plenty. <laughs> Does C-SPAN still get that? Don't worry, they'll edit it out. What did, what did you want to say? We can we can edit that out. Please not edit that out. What do you, what what do you, what would you like to say? No, it's fine. Oh, okay. I have all I need to send to American University. Well, I'm still in charge of your grades, so thanks for letting me know. <laughs> This is a fun game. Uh, Okay, anything else? Uh, What I'm also planning to do is, uh, as we move into spring, uh, what I'll do is I'll be in touch probably with some of you about uh, publishing your papers on our website. So keep that in mind when you submit the final version of the paper. Uh, And if you do submit an, an exceptional paper... Uh, I would be happy to work with you to publish it sometime in the spring. The final thing I want to just show you 
is that for the past 18 months, myself and my team at the association has been working hard on this new initiative, Slavery in the President's Neighborhood. We talked a little bit about this subject earlier in the semester, uh, but now we've kind of reached the point where this initiative is starting to, to really kind of come together. And uh, this is actually the temporary collection that we have. So if you're interested in learning more about this subject, uh, we have information about you know, the history of slavery in D.C. itself, uh, slavery at George Washington's presidential homes, um, scrolling down, then the enslaved households of James Madison, Thomas Jefferson. Um, and then we have individual standalone pieces that specifically focus on enslaved individuals who either worked at the White House, had some association with the White House, and, uh, and their stories and their family stories. Now, we didn't get to visit Decatur House, uh, so this article right here, uh, this is the, the article that I wrote about it. Um, but part of what's coming along with this is we actually have a new website being designed, and we're planning on launching it in February, so just stay tuned for that. But it's going to have uh, essentially a virtual tour of the, of the slave quarters. Um, we have new exhibit paneling. Uh, we have an interactive timeline that's going on it, so you'll be able to literally scroll through and see key moments in American history related to slavery, key moments in the district related to slavery, but then also where these individuals fit on this specific timeline. Uh, I do believe that this is a subject that needs more exploration, needs more research. Um, so as you're, how many people are history majors? Anybody? Okay, just a couple. Um, but if you're, if you're thinking about going that direction and maybe someday down the road you are thinking about like you want to write a research paper or I just want you to be aware of this resource um, because it's, uh, I'm really proud of the work we've done and uh, I just want people to know about it so they use it. Okay. All right. Have a wonderful exam week. Luckily, you don't have to take an exam here. You'll just email the papers. And if you need, if you need anything, you can reach me by email. Are you teaching any more classes besides this week? Not in spring. Yeah, of course. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah, take care. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.